Today on Under the Big Tree, creating a modular synth for live performance part 3, large scale design and layout. Have you ever looked at someone else's modular synth or seen one in a brick and mortar store? Were you able to look at it and figure out the lay of the land right away? Let's pretend for a moment that someone brought to you a modular system that you had never seen before. Your mission was then to create coherent, structured music on it in front of an audience of 500 people, and the curtain was going up in five minutes. Would you be nervous? Now, let's have that same scenario, except this time the modular was completely designed by you. It was filled with modules you knew really well, and moreover, the arrangement of those modules felt ergonomic and made logical sense to you. Most importantly, the large-scale choices in what types of modules you had were dictated by your overarching sense of what a modular synth should be, at least for you. And not only had you made those architectural decisions, bought and or built the modules you thought could best realize your aims, and wired them up in a layout that made sense to you, but you also had a month of experimenting and playing with the system. Now, how would you feel about going out in front of that waiting audience? In today's episode, we are going to look at the overarching structure of the instrument I want to build. We are not yet worrying about the individual modules or a specific layout, but just how I want it to work in general terms. We'll look at a layout of modular functions that will best fit the MDLR case I bought to house this performance instrument, figuring out roughly how much real estate I can allocate to each function. These ideas and early design decisions will then dictate which modules that I already own will make it into the performance case and which modules I'm going to need to buy or build. So putting it all together, we know that every modular synth has to live within a fixed amount of real estate. That limitation drives decisions on which modules can fit into the system. Moreover, by planning ahead of time the functionality you want to get out of your system, you can make wiser choices about which modules to spend your limited dollars on. Having said all that, creating a modular synth system is an iterative process, and there should absolutely be room to change your mind as you move along, adding and changing features as you gain a deeper understanding of what the modules can do, working together in a big symbiotic mass of awesomeness. With all that in mind, Let's take a look at the first revision of the large-scale design and layout of my performance-oriented modular. When I first started my Eurorack system, I really felt that I was stumbling around in the dark, making mistakes no matter how careful I was. And I'm someone who has had a ton of experience with Moog, Serge, and Buchla modular synths, as well as most of the major keyboard synths from the 70s and 80s. In any case, the point is that it took a while to get my sea legs to understand what worked and what didn't for me, what sounds as well as what manufacturers and even what graphical layouts I preferred. So in many ways, this performance synth is really version 2.0 of my Eurorack system. But armed with the knowledge that I have from the first iteration, I think with some careful planning, I'll reach my design goals. And what are those design goals? Well, here is my list of essentials. Four pitched voices, which I will think of as soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. Four percussion voices, kick, snare, hat, slash, shaker, and extra percussion. Four noise and texture voices. These are the sounds that will allow for drones, sound design, and long experimental timbres. I want to have multiple pulse streams at different subdivisions of the beat. The ability to improvisationally create polyrhythms and melodic material from analog sequencers. The ability to quickly and easily route melodies and rhythms to any of the pitched voices. And the ability to quickly and easily route rhythms to the percussion voices. The ability to quickly and easily transpose and alter melodic material from the sequencers. And the ability to create slowly unfolding generative drone-like textures. Dedicated filters for all pitched and texture voices. Dedicated tight, snappy ADSR, or maybe just AR, envelope generators for each pitched voice. The ability to interface with the outside world easily and with proper levels and impedances. And here is my list of nice-to-have items. No computer interface or MIDI. A three-voice chordal source to help define our harmonic structure. 
a 12-channel performance mixer with effect sends, preferably in the case. High quality reverb. Onboard effects processing, especially for the noise voices. Some type of performance controller. Ribbon? Maybe pressure plates? These design ideas didn't just spring forth fully formed from my head like Athena popping out of Zeus's noggin. My starting point is the design work done by my favorite modular artist, Stevio. His work is entirely musical, with deep, funky grooves and jazz harmonies. It works on a simple techno level, but if you listen closely, you can hear the sophistication of his drum grooves, including the use of swing. The melodic material is polyrhythmic in nature, with material colliding from two synthesizers operating at different time signatures to create a kaleidoscope of notes that have far more complexity than their simple individual sequences would imply. The first time I heard this stuff, and heard the 7 sharp 9 chord being ingeniously coaxed from three oscillators on his Moog Voyager, I realized just how much depth you can get out of an analog system, with some careful thought beforehand. Finally, his system is completely oriented towards live improvisation on the fly. Rather than creating a system that involves a lot of patching every time you create a new piece, Stevio has constructed a purpose-built improvisation machine that reflects his personal musical sensibilities and allows him to get them across to an appreciative audience. If you haven't heard Stevio's work, you absolutely should. I've placed a couple of links in the description below so you can check it out. He is the perfect example of an artist who can coax really expressive and complex music out of a basic set of modules. The whole truly is more than the sum of the parts. So let's begin by creating a list of the functions that our system needs, which would then correspond to the modules that we will use. Now, just like everything else in modular synthesis, even this list is open to a bit of interpretation and will be tweaked to taste. For example, there are certainly many modules out there that combine functions. Modules that are all-in-one synth voices could have oscillators, filters, envelope generators, LFOs, and VCAs all in a single module. Low-pass gates combine filters and VCAs. That will certainly limit your layout choices, but also might take up less overall real estate than having all those functions delegated to different modules. For the sake of this discussion, though, let's approach it from a more granular perspective, assuming that different functions are each represented by individual modules. So in the largest sense, we can categorize our modules as audio modules and control modules. Audio modules would be anything that directly generates, routes, or modifies audio signals. This would include oscillators, filters, mixers, audio input and output systems to connect your instrument to the outside world, and signal processors like delays, reverbs, and distortion. Control modules would consist of modules that generate the control voltages that change parameters of the audio modules. This would include things like sequencers, quantizers, clocks, envelope generators, LFOs, and anything else that can generate or modify a voltage control or clock pulse signal. Then there are utility modules like MULTs, logic modules, and switchers that could either be categorized under control modules or perhaps considered as their own separate animal. For my purposes, I'm actually going to consider them separately for one simple reason. I want to utilize the one-use strips as much as possible for this type of utility so that they don't take up the more valuable 3U real estate. Utility modules often don't have any knobs at all, so they are just perfect to make as small as possible. With all that said, since my case has top and bottom sections, I'm going to put the control modules in the top half and the audio modules in the bottom half. And as mentioned above, I'll put as many MULTs, logic modules, and input and output modules into the two one U strips. I really like this approach because it feels intuitive to me. Things like clocks and note generators start at the top and work their way downwards towards the things that make the noises, then modify the noises before leaving the system. Having said that, these are my general guidelines. If it turns out to make more sense to have envelope generators or signal switchers closer to the audio voices themselves, I will have no problem putting them there. But you have to start somewhere. And again, you may think of signal routing completely differently. There are certainly arguments to be made for the serendipity and out-of-the-box thinking that you get by seating the various modules next to each other randomly or in some other organizational paradigm. The only thing that is important is for you to assemble a system that is personal and makes sense to you. The goal is to be able to change the parameter you want to change on the fly in the heat of the moment without having to hunt around or try to figure out the signal flow. 
If you think about it, this is one of the incredibly cool aspects of modular synthesis. When you play a traditional instrument like a piano or guitar, it's really up to you to approach the instrument on its terms, adapting your expression to the user interface and its limitations and layout. Modular puts all that choice into your hands, which gives you a lot more flexibility, but it also requires a lot of thought in the design phase. Here's some food for thought. Since my primary language is English and I was raised in the Western world, I'm going to naturally think of the signal flow as top to bottom and left to right. I wonder whether synthesis whose native language flows right to left, like Hebrew or Arabic, would think of it the same way. If you have any insight into this question, please leave your thoughts in the comments section. So now that we have come up with a layout paradigm in the broadest terms, let's zoom in a level and further define our functions. So looking at the control system first, we have to start with the heartbeat of this system, the master clock, and the pulse streams that emanate from it in various subdivisions. That whole system will actually be the subject of my next video. The master clock will control the tempo of everything, allowing all of the disparate elements within the system to trigger in musical time. In order to allow performance and recording with other people, the master clock also has to have a clock in so it can slave to the tempo of someone else's system. So we know that we are going to want at least two main sequencers. These two will be able to generate patterns and rhythms in different meters, which will create a ton of variation in how the musical lines interact. Since I already have two superb sequencers, the Depfer A155-154 combo and a clay sequencer that I built from a kit, those will likely be them. In addition, we're going to want satellite sequencers as well as some generative modules like the Turing machine and something to generate Euclidean rhythms. The goal is to have a number of different sequences running at the same time at different time signatures and subdivision values that can interact with each other to create an ever-changing landscape of groove and intertwining melodies. <laughs> Should be a piece of cake. The part of Stevio's modular system that absolutely blew my mind was the signal routing. Through careful use of mults, switches, and depth for precision adders, it looks like Stevio is able to route the various sequences to any voices in his system. Aside from being amazingly cool and flexible, this creates tons of depth in having a performance system where you are not repatching cables, but flicking switches and turning knobs to steer the ship all over the ocean. I've been experimenting with this stuff for quite a while now, and it's definitely going to take a lot of careful thought to make it work the way I imagine it to. Utilities are a crucial, if rather humdrum, aspect of modular synthesis. You absolutely need malts, logic gates, and switches to steer those electrons where you want them to go. As previously mentioned, I'm going to try to maximize the use of the 1U strips for utility and interface stuff, and keep the precious 3U real estate for the fun stuff. The oscillator system is every module that generates the original audio signals for our system. Only four of them are actual oscillators, but it's convenient shorthand to label all noisemakers in that way. Since we have 12 voices, that means we will need 12 oscillators. The four pitched sources need to be straight up analog oscillators that track pitch well. The four percussion sources consist of kick, snare, hi-hat, shaker, and additional percussion modules. And the four drone or texture modules can consist of whatever we want. I think that sample playback, digital wavetable oscillators, and perhaps processing of external sounds through pickups or microphone inputs might yield some interesting results here. At the bare minimum, each of the pitched voices is going to need a corresponding amplitude envelope in VCA. In a perfect world, I'd like to have a couple of envelopes per voice so we can have different envelopes for the filter cutoff, but that may take up more room than we have available. We shall see. The other thing I really want is for the envelopes to be super snappy. They need to have a short enough attack and decay times that the pitched voices start out as purely percussive elements, and then, by gently increasing the decay time, you start hearing the pitched aspect of the note. Maths is terrific for this, but it's expensive and takes up a lot of real estate. I'd need two of them just to handle the envelopes for the pitched voices, and it seems that some research into other envelopes is in order here. One interesting possibility is the Synthrotech ADSR. 79 bucks for the kit, only 4 HP, the timing appears to be very tight, and you can switch between linear and exponential envelope shapes. The best thing to do will be to purchase a single kit, build it and see if it's the right one, then buy three more if it is. Filters are again a really personal choice. They can have a huge effect on shaping the timbre of your oscillators, of course. There are low-pass filters, high-pass filters, band-pass filters, and many variations and combinations. 
My favorite low-pass filters right now are the Erica Synths Polyvox filters. Another relatively inexpensive DIY kit, this may very well be the way I go for the pitched voices, and I'll probably use some of my other existing filters for the textural voices. Not everything can be planned out in advance, and it's always great to have additional modulation sources to act as another hand on the knobs. LFOs and random generators are perfect tools for that, creating additional control voltages that can be used to add more variety to the system. I'm particularly a fan of very slow LFOs that change large-scale features of the piece over time, say altering the tempo or the density of elements we're hearing at a given time. It's always fun to have signal processing capabilities that you can use to add flavor to your sounds. Delays, distortions, wave shaping, and granular manipulators like clouds all can add freshness to what you're doing. Unfortunately, they have to compete for space with everything else, so I'll have to choose carefully to pick my absolute favorites. So the big mixing question is whether to have the mixer on board or to use a separate standalone unit. While I really want to keep everything inside the box, there is just an undeniable advantage to having it connect to an external mixer. Were I to put mixing in the box, it would use up at least 80 HP and cost north of 500 bucks. If on the other hand, I purchase a Mackie 12-channel Pro FX V2 mixer for 250 bucks, then I get all the functionality of an internal mixer plus built-in reverb, some moderately reasonable EQ, the ability to route out to other external effects, and the pièce de résistance, a USB output to allow for incredibly easy recording of your set to a laptop. It would involve having the mixer, a carrying case, and a custom 12-channel snake to go between the mixer and the modular. But the flexibility, cost savings, and real estate savings just give that idea a huge advantage. So. If we end up going with an external mixer, that simplifies the interface system considerably. Delay and reverb can be handled by the mixer, not within the case. We would have 12 audio signals leaving the case and going to the 12 line inputs of the mixer. The piece of that puzzle that will require some research is how to get modular synth level voltage down to line level, making sure that there is sufficient headroom and an optimized impedance that matches what the mixer is looking for. It could require an active system, or could be as simple as placing a properly valued resistor somewhere between the Eurorack lineouts and the Mackie line ends. I'm intrigued with a one use solution from Pulp Logic. You can have a patch bay with eight inputs that terminate in another plate with a DB25 connector, wired in the agreed upon audio standard. If I bought two of these, I'd have 16 outputs from the system connected by two snakes to the outside world. And the best part is that DB25 to quarter inch snakes are plentiful, so I could save my soldering time for building modules instead of cables. Stay tuned for further developments. So this is the phase where we start to figure out our overall plan. Eurorack is really too time intensive and expensive to shoot from the hip and buy a bunch of modules. I think that aspect happens at the beginning of many synthesists' experience, including myself. But once you have a better idea of what you want, planning a course to get there helps you make it happen. And in this case, we're going to start with creating a rough replica of our case in Modular Grid. If you haven't been to Modular Grid, it is absolutely the right place to help plan your system. You can lay out virtual racks that are the same size as your physical racks. Then you can lay modules out there, experimenting with sizes and locations of everything. Remember, planning things out is free. Purchasing a module that is too big or not what you really need is when things start getting expensive. Here's a rough layout of the functions in my system. I like grouping like things together, but that is by no means the only way to do it. As long as your organizational strategy is consistent and makes sense to you, then go for it. The modular police won't be knocking down your door, demanding to know why you put an LFO right next to a Boolean OR gate. As mentioned, the top case will house the pieces that generate the note and rhythm data. The upper right side will have the primary pulse streams for the system. Then the rest of the top row is sequencers, as well as most of the bottom row. The rest of the bottom row holds modules to route and switch the sequence data to the various voices, almost like a railroad train yard. We will get into all of these functions in detail in future episodes. The bottom case holds the noisemakers. We have our percussion modules on the upper right side. On the left side, we have ADSR envelopes and VCAs, and in between we can squeeze in LFOs and random voltage generators. The bottom row is our sound devices. We start with our SATB oscillators right next to their corresponding filters. 
then we have signal processors and the noisemakers that will make the drones and textural sounds. So now that we have the mid-level view in place, let's zoom in and actually start putting some modules in place. Modular Grid is the perfect tool for this, allowing us to select modules from a gigantic database and pasting their images all scaled to the correct size into our system. I'm going to start with the modules I have, which is actually a pretty good portion of what I need. Priority goes to modules that are narrow in width while still sounding great, like the Dixie 2 Plus and STO oscillators. The only modules that I'm going to let break that rule are the sequencers themselves, which gobble up a ton of real estate, and my mutable instruments modules, because they're utterly fantastic. Then, we can start duplicating the modules to plan for everything we need for our long-term goal. For example, I know I want four oscillators for the SATB pitched oscillators, and I have two that currently fit, the Dixie 2 Plus and STO. By putting two more Dixies into modular grid as placeholders, I know how much space they'll take up. This also makes a nice visual wish list for your future module purchases. So it's easy to get lost in the weeds at this point, as you can start going down rabbit holes, ogling different modules that you might want, and I've certainly done some of that, but I'm trying to keep to a more holistic picture at this point. Once this is roughed in, then we can start working on individual systems, adding those modules into the rig, and testing and optimizing them. There are a lot of steps to designing and building a modular system to achieve your particular goals, but it's an awfully fun process! So the goal of this episode was to figure out what modules I needed to achieve my particular goal and where to locate them within the case to make the signal flow as intuitive as possible. To do this, I started with a series of design goals. These consisted of features the system needs to have, as well as some lower priority nice-to-haves. We noted that I really love the music and instrument design aesthetic of the modular artist Stevio, and many of my ideas are based on ground that he has already paved. From there, we separated the various functions into control systems and audio systems, and decided that control would mostly be on top, and audio would mostly be on the bottom. Then, we further specified the systems as consisting of clocks, sequencers, signal routing, utility, oscillators, envelopes, LFOs and random generators, signal processing, mixing, and interfacing with the outside world. Finally, we roughed out the approximate layout of these systems using a screenshot of a case from Modular Grid. This gives us a realistic notion of how many modules we can fit and how to budget room for each system. Wow, that's an awful lot for one episode. If you made it this far, thanks so much for sticking with me. In the next episode, we finally get into actual modules when we look at the clock system. So that's it for this episode of Under the Big Tree. If you like, join the conversation by sharing your thoughts and experiences on this topic in the comments section below. As always, if you like what we're doing here on Under the Big Tree, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. For now, this is Nick, signing off.